The Temple Mount is perhaps the most contested piece of real estate in the world. The Temple Institute, a non-profit organization, is dedicated to raising public awareness than the rebuilding of the Third Temple. Rabbi Chaim Richmond talks to InfoLive TV. The Temple Institute is a very unique organization because it was founded with the sole purpose of doing as much as possible to raise the consciousness for the Jewish people and really for the whole world as to the central role that the Holy Temple plays in the life of mankind. And this is really a basic principle of Jewish faith that the Holy Temple is not just some magnificent synagogue. It really wasn't a synagogue at all or just some beautiful building rooted in the biblical past of the Middle East, but rather it's seen by the Torah as the vehicle that brings about a certain spiritual reconciliation between all of mankind and God. And of course, every prophet of Israel tells us that the time will come when the Temple will again be rebuilt. And actually, it's the era, the epic of the Third Temple, which is seen for example, when we study Isaiah, as the, as the time which will be unparalleled in human history when all mankind will be at peace and united in the recognition of, of God. So everything that we do is really about um, the restoration of the, of the, pro the promise of the temple. Um, there is a number of ways that we go about this, the uh, production of educational materials and curriculum that are used all over the world, and conferences and publications, but the main focal point of our work where we're standing right now is actually the reconstruction of vessels that can actually be used in the Holy Temple. As Israel and the Palestinians prepare for another peace summit, the future status of Jerusalem has been thrust to the forefront. Many remain skeptical over the funds invested in the future reconstruction of the temple and if it will bring true peace. Well, you know, a lot of people will try anything for, um, for peace, and uh, John Lennon said, all we're saying is give peace a chance. And so why not try the one thing that God himself promises, for example, through the prophet Haggai, where he says, in this place, I will grant peace. You know, we try not to be political. We're really not a political organization at all. It's, it's just totally a religious and educational undertaking, but it's kind of hard to separate for the Jewish people living in the land of Israel, the, the um, connotation of all of this, obviously, the Holy Temple doesn't go in Hartford, Connecticut. It goes, uh, it goes here on the Temple Mount, which is something that God himself uh, declared. Um, but basically, the idea is that, you know, we're really just trying to do everything possible as a declaration of our faith, that we believe that this is the destiny of the Jewish people. And... You know, Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach of blessed memory used to say something very beautiful. When, when confronted with this question, you know, we look at the geopolitical reality today and, and it's the, the very last thing in the world that anyone expects is that there'd be some sort of situation wherein the Jewish people could rebuild the Holy Temple. He used to say, you know what, if we're the people that we're really supposed to be, the Muslims would come to us and say, could you please build the Holy Temple on this mountain? And, and bring the divine presence back into the world because the Jewish people are instructed in the Torah to be a light to the nations. What does that mean? You know, we're called a, um, a kingdom of priests and a holy people, the chosen people. Now, not everyone is comfortable with that appellation. I woke up one morning and there it was. I didn't fill out a form. And it doesn't mean that we're the best pediatricians and Wall Street brokers and film producers. We happen to be that also, but that might be a coincidence. But what it really means is that God has chosen the Jewish people to be the vehicle throughout the saga of human history wherein he proclaims to the whole world that he exists. And you know what? When you look at a Jew in the world today, there's no other explanation for the fact that we're here except that there's a God in the world. And, and really, the Holy Temple is not an ethnocentric thing. It's not only for the Jewish people when the Holy Temple stood Isaiah says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And the whole world streamed there to engage in this direct relationship with God. And this is what we're promised when the Holy Temple is built, that it will once again become the focal point of the spiritual energy of mankind. Years of research are invested into studying the various artifacts, musical instruments, vessels and robes worn, the metals, precious gems and cloth used. Once complete, craftsmen and artisans set about executing them accordingly. Things that we are working on here and that are displayed and that have been seen by people from all over the world are not merely replicas or copies or models, but they're actually real, so they can actually be used in the Holy Temple. In other words, they are made according to the exact requirements of Jewish law, so that they, to use the phrase, are actually kosher and can actually be functional in the Holy Temple. And that is really what catapults this project into an exercise in not only faith, but action as well. Here we have one of the most um, magnificent vessels of the Holy Temple. It's the table of the showbread that sits in the sanctuary itself, in the holy area of the Holy Temple. 
um, the Bible describes to us in the book of Exodus that there's a golden table on which are placed 12 loaves of specially baked bread which represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And these breads, called the showbread, are um, to be displayed before the Shekhinah, the divine presence in the Holy Temple at all times. This is a lyre as opposed to a harp. The lyre has ten strings, and this actually is the, is the instrument which in Jewish tradition is associated with King David. And in fact, there is a teaching in the Talmud that King David had a lyre suspended above his bed, and then at midnight, a north wind blew on it of its own accord and woke him up, and in those wee hours, he um, did his own private meditation with God and wrote the book of Psalms. So this is actually the lyre of King David. One of the best examples of the complex research involved in every item is when it comes to the garments of the high priest. Here the Bible uses words referring to the colors of the weavings, the blue and the crimson and the scarlet. We know that these come from certain, um, certain plants and, and certain animals, and there's a great deal of mystery regarding what these colors are. Uh, when it comes to the breastplate of the high priest, one of the eight garments the breastplate of the high priest, which is considered one of the eight garments of the high priest. The twelve stones of the breastplate of the high priest, of course, which, of course, which are um, representative of the twelve tribes of Israel, these stones took the scholars and rabbis of the Temple Institute over a decade to reach a final conclusive identification of, of what the stones are. Recently, a delegation of ministers from Papua visited the institution and contributed $10,000 gold bars and precious gems. Richmond says people from many countries and all walks of life identify and support the cause. This is definitely a, a phenomenon that, um, that we have seen over the years, which really makes perfect sense because the Holy Temple is like a magnet that attracts people from all over the world. As we mentioned earlier, the verse in Isaiah, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. We have many people from all over the world that are uh, extremely supportive and interested in the concept of the Holy Temple. And um, I think on a, on a level of uh, uh, prophetic fulfillment, this is a very, very beautiful thing. We have people from all walks of life, from all over the world, who feel so motivated to do something to identify with the Jewish people and with the God of Israel. Really over 35 countries um, from all over the world, from as far away as, uh, as India, and now, as you mentioned, Papua, um, many, many people throughout uh, North America, uh, all over Europe, uh, many people from, um, from Qatar, Qatar, which is uh, kind of a surprise, as you can imagine. Um, have come come forward. Um, also, um, most recently, Papua and uh, India, uh, some from Indonesia, and uh, even um, we had once um, a delegation from Mongolia. Whatever the outcome of peace negotiations, Jerusalem will always remain the heart and soul of the Jewish people. And as Richmond says, one nation, really walking together as one people, around one heart. The eyes of the world are really on the developments in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, it, the very word, is like a symphony to the ear for all people who really feel connected to the Bible. It's mentioned over 700 times in the Bible, and it's always synonymous with everything really that's good and right in the world. And the only city, of course, that was, that was called the, the city of God, that God himself chose. But, but why, when we think about it, what is so special about Jerusalem? And we have to realize it is the, 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 the secret that lies in its heart, the enigma of the Holy Temple, and the promise of living life on a, a whole different level of fulfillment. And that's really what the concept of the temple is all about. And when we look in earlier history and we, and we look at the, the idea of the Jewish people having exited Egypt, building the tabernacle in the desert, that's this idea of one nation really walking together as one man around one heart with God in its midst. And that message is not only for the Jewish, but for the whole world.